So as you know, Pastor Matt and Jenny are off to a, at a, a pastor's conference this week, and we have the opportunity to hear from our own brother, Mike Schmaus, who has been with us for most of the year, came last spring, even, the, uh, uh, even though he is from that town where the Steelers are. Uh, we found out he's still a good guy, and um, Pastor Matt promised us we will not be disappointed uh, from the blessing from his relevant and timely word we're going to hear this morning. So, Pastor Mike, sure. Brother Mike. Thanks, John. All right, so am I on out there? Can you guys hear me? Fantastic. First of all, I want to give a, a big thanks to the praise and worship team. You know, throughout any given week, there's a lot we wrestle with, right? And our hearts can kind of get hard. And that really breaks up the soil in our hearts and prepares us to receive what the Spirit would have us to, to learn from God's Word. So just a big, big thanks to, to you all this morning. A while back, Matt, Matt came up to me, uh, Pastor Matt, and said, knowing that I, I've been in uh, cemetery, I'm sorry, seminary for a couple of years, I joke, there are, sad, it's sad but true, there are many who teach the Bible in seminaries across our country who do not believe the Bible. They don't care about the Bible. They don't think it's inspired. They don't think it's inerrant. And that truly, in my opinion, is a travesty. But I digress. But knowing that I've been seminary for a while, knowing that after my career in the Air Force, God willing, I'll be doing full-time ministry to the Jewish people. And um, he said, I would love to afford you this opportunity to, uh, to speak while I'm away at this conference. And I said, that would be, that'd be fantastic. And I said, well, what would you like to, me to speak upon about? I'll, I'll go ahead and work something up. And he said, well, just, just go with what the Lord leads you to speak upon. So that's kind of an open box. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was this message. Although when I met with Matt last Monday, just out of respect for him and his position, I wanted to, to, to go over my message and say, are you okay with this? Because he needs to be okay with this as a shepherd of his congreg this congregation. And what a great shepherd he is, right? He said, because I said, I have one in the queue that's a little more middle of the road, a little more slow pitch softball, a little more vanilla. And hey, I like vanilla. But this, this is some, some deep stuff. This is uh, some meat that we'll get to chew on. If you don't catch any, everything as I go through it, uh, I can make the slides available. There's a lot of references there. You can take it and chew on it throughout the week and beyond. Um, but the beauty of God's word is that a young child can understand the gospel, right? And, and the greatest minds can, can spend lifetimes and never come to the bottom of the depths of the riches of God's word. So uh, I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity. And uh, I hope that any words of mine will go in one ear and out the other. And what is true, it's not true or neat or amazing because I say it, it's true and neat and amazing because God said it. And I pray that that would take deep root in your hearts and grow. So with that, let's go ahead and pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who has given us the way of salvation in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We praise you, God. There is none like you. There is no one worthy of worship like you are. And I pray that you would move your Holy Spirit in our hearts and our minds, illuminate your word for us, help us to glean from it what you would have us to, and encourage us and empower us, God, to live it out in the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we go forth from here for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you don't have to raise your hand, but have any of you ever been made to feel silly or stupid because you believe the Bible? People say, you know, why would you, you know, faith is just a crutch. The Bible is just, it's another book written by people. You know, and not only that, but the words contained in it, you know, they're archaic. They're out of touch. You know, they were written all the way back then. And how, how could they be relevant to us today? You know, and, and then not only that, you'll have people say, well, it's, you know, the God of the Bible, he's really you know, I don't know. He seems kind of barbaric at times, and I, I don't think that's a God I want to worship. You hear all these things attacking the Word of God, and, you, and sometimes you can start to feel, like, why, why do I really believe this? 
And you know, there's a couple avenues we could take today to really cement our faith and our trust in that what we have with our Bibles today is the inspired Word of God, the inerrant Word of God. We could take manuscript evidence. There's an embarrassment of riches when it comes especially to the New Testament, whether it's Greek, Syriac, Coptic. There is no other work, literary work of antiquity that comes even remotely close to the manuscript evidence we have that attests to the truthfulness and veracity of Scripture. But we're not going to go that route. We could take the, the multitude of, of archaeological finds that have verified that what the Bible has said has happened in its, in its accounts and, and within its pages. Those things have happened where they have happened. But we're not going to go that route. We're going to take a different route, a theological route today. Um, and we're going to take, next slide, please. We're going to go from this principle. Now, there were, this is one of several principles that existed, still exists in Judaism today, but especially in the Second Temple period, the first century where Jesus came and uh, ministered, called Binyan of Mikotub Echad, literally building a family from one scripture. So we're going to start here, and you'll see this. Jesus does this um, in his reply to the Pharisees about the vineyard. He quotes from Isaiah. Um, he takes the patches there. Um, when it comes to the resurrection with the Sadducees or kind of mocking the idea of the resurrection, Jesus uses this principle and builds his instruction, which is authoritative because it comes from him, from Exodus chapter 6. So this is a very common way that Jewish rabbis taught, and this is how um, we're going to approach this lesson today. And you'll notice in Proverbs, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Now, this is not the passage we're going to build but I, wanted, I do want to set a foundation, as it were, um, for the principle of the teaching. The word underlined and rendered matter is dabar or davar, and it means a spoken thing, a word. So it's, it's the glory of God to conceal his word, what is spoken. And God doesn't conceal things to keep them from us. Now, the secret things belong to him, and we don't know him exhaustively. We see this with Job, right? When he, when he questions Job, and he says, now listen to me. Hey, where were you, bud, when I laid the foundations of creation? So we're not meant to know everything exhaustively, but God hides things because he wants people to seek it, and he wants that to lead to another thing and ultimately to a deeper relationship with him. And it reminds me, uh, when I was in third grade, my brother was in sixth grade, we really wanted laser tag. My parents, I mean, I love my parents. They're not overly exciting people. They don't really do exciting things. But this was a kind of an exciting Christmas where they left notes, and we had a whole trail of like scavenger hunt notes to find, which ultimately led to um, not laser tag, but a generic knockoff of laser tag <laughs> called Photon, which was very disappointing, um, but uh, the finding it was very exciting. And of course, what God has in store for us at the end is not some generic laser tag. It is ultimately leading to the living word relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. So this is the the, um, the foundation, the, the principle that we'll build upon. And it's interesting, you know, as much as people mock the word, um, God is always proven true. In the 18th century, there was a man named Francois-Marie Arouet. Uh, he became known, uh, this is what he changed his name for, uh, to, because he didn't like his father, so he changed his name to Voltaire. And Voltaire was no friend of Christianity. Now, he's purported as saying there's a famous quote that many apologists will use, and this is uh, him saying, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. So we don't know where that source is. We can't really attribute that to him, but we can attribute these following quotes to him. He says, the Bible, that is what fools have written, what imbeciles commend, what rogues teach and young children are made to learn by heart. To invent all those things in the Bible is the last degree of rascality. To believe them is the extreme of brutal stupidity. So he was no friend of Christianity, and he would sign all his correspondence to his, his friends with accroze la infamy, which means crush the infamy. An infamy meaning a bad thing, an evil thing. He was speaking of Christianity. Crush Christianity. And well, you know, Voltaire didn't seem to know or care if he did know that God's word says he will not be mocked, that he is true and every man a liar. And what's very fascinating, not surprising to us who are believers, is that um, 
not more than 60 years after he died, the president of the Evangelical Society of uh, Geneva, Henri Trochin, used his house, Voltaire's old house, to store Bibles and gospel tracts to be spread throughout the whole of Europe. So <laughs> people can shake their fist all they want at God. God wants all to repent and come to salvation in, in Christ. But the truth of the, of the matter is not, not everyone does. And God's word will be true no matter what pe- we choose. So... Uh, you're not crazy for believing the Bible, and you can absolutely trust that God is who he says he is, and he does what he says he will do. And I pray if you get anything else from this morning, you will all leave here with a greater sense of awe in the majesty of God in his word, and with a greater sense of trust uh, in his word as well. So next slide. Here is the verse we're going to build this teaching on. Isaiah 46, 9, 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, Rashid, that's the word we're going to dig into. From ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So context is important. Um, they say a text taken out of context, divorced from its co-text, is simply a pretext. You have to take in context. There's different contexts. We won't go into all that here. But this verse, in this verse, we see God telling Isaiah long before the Babylonian empire that Babylon, her gods would fall and they'd be carried away by her enemies. Next slide, please. This is uh, an ancient relief of the Assyrians doing just that to people they have conquered. It's a very common practice. They take their gods, and this is a show of force that they have totally dominated uh, those that they have, they have gone to battle against. And of course, the Babylonians were conquered by the Medo-Persians, who were conquered by the Greeks, who were conquered by the Romans. So, uh, which shows you that no human kingdom stands forever. In the verses preceding and just after uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, we see... Um, the gods, let's see here, Get my, if I can see, uh, again, being carried off. Um, this is long before the Babylonian Empire. Isaiah prophesied during uh, the time of so like 740 to 701 B.C., during the time of the Assyrian captivity, where they, the northern tribes were taken away. They never came back. Um, and now Babylon, who would later in 586 B.C. take away the southern kingdom, the Judeans, the kingdom of Judah, um, he's, he's, God is revealing to him that they will fall and that we see after uh, this passage in 40, chapter 47, we read, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame also will be exposed. I will take vengeance. Sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the queen of kingdoms. Babylon was very prideful. They thought that, like every kingdom, that they were the best, and God says, you are not the best. And in fact, what we see here is that um, God is reminding his people that all the pagan gods are inferior to him, that he alone is the one true God who fears no one and has the ability to deliver his people from their enemies and all the tragedies, tragedies that they face in life. And he goes even further, and he contrasts himself with these pagan deities you see, some of these gods, ancient uh, works of art, show them wearing sorcerer hats, um, and that they had the ability to, through incantations and spells, to control uh, the the environment, to, to look into the future and make predictions. Um, God is saying, "I declare everything from the beginning, the end from the beginning. I don't need spells. I don't need cheap tricks. I am the one who declares." And ultimately, He's calling His people back. Because he knows that the Judeans will be in Babylon. Recall these words that the prophet Isaiah spoke and find comfort and know that they will be defeated and ultimately I will be victorious. And put your faith in me no matter how things look. So moving on from that, let's go to the next slide. God is able to uniquely do this because he exists out of time and space. And we get a glimpse of this in this verse in Revelation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. 
Wrap your mind around that one. So it's already done. God does not have a plan B. It's always been plan A. Now, it may appear to us that there's a plan B, that somehow he was caught off guard uh, in the Garden of Eden by the sin of Eve and Adam, Adam and Eve, but he wasn't. Before time even came into existence, the lamb was slain. And there's a great uh, depiction of this in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Aslan just, he resurrects and he's talking with Susan and Lucy, and he's explaining to them what happened. Um, And here's what he says. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, there's a magic deeper still, which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time, But if she could have looked a little further back, she would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack, and death itself would start working backward. It is like this. We need the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word. You can't read the Bible and get the message that God has intended for you to get in the flesh with the naked eye. There's something deeper there. Now, don't get me wrong. We don't want to go wild with spiritualism and allegory. It has to be connected to what is literal. Symbols don't mean anything if they aren't connected to what is literal. There has to be a connection there. Otherwise, it's just nonsense. So, likewise, there's a deeper truth in Scripture that is unseen by the naked eye, but it's always been there. The word of God is likened by Jesus himself in the parable of the sower to a seed. And what is contained in a seed? Well, it's the genetic information that produces that which is after its own kind. And unless something is injected into the seed or something is extracted from the seed, the seed will produce that which is intended and made and created to produce. Example, an apple seed produces an apple tree, which produces an apple seed. Unless it's tampered with, remember, God says, do not add to my word and do not take away from my word. The word is a seed and it's meant to produce something. So, in a way, already but not yet. Everything has been done. Everything in the very beginning, we're going to see not only from the very beginning, from the very first letter of the Torah we see how everything has already been done in God's design and is yet to be revealed. That line in the song, you know, uh, your glory hidden in creation, revealed in Jesus Christ. So God always is. We exist in time and space. Next slide. So this is akin to DNA. What is DNA, you ask? Well, there you go. DNA is an extremely long chain of molecules that contains all the information necessary for the life functions of a cell, and it wasn't discovered until the mid-19th century, but it's always been there. All right? We all have genetic information that's produced us, and what comes to my mind is before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now, God is explicitly talking to Jeremiah there, but the same principle applies to us. Already but not yet, God knew us, the very point of conception, all the information that God has intended to produce you and make you unique was already there. And we see our lives develop, that information developed over time and over space. And you you might be asking, well, how long is that chain? Next slide. Just to give uh, some perspective of the majesty of God, Um, All the information needed to specify an organism as complex as man weighs less than a few thousand millionths of a gram, and that all the DNA lined up end-to-end would stretch beyond the solar system. Are you kidding me? And those people that say there's not a God, that there's no creator, that we're just some happenstance, some primordial soup, a random collocation of atoms and molecules. I don't think so. There's a DNA like this in God's Word. Next slide. So this chart, hard to see, but you'll see the ancient Semitic Hebrew to the left and falling to the right, the modern Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Now what's interesting is the Hebrew language is tripartite. Fascinating. God is tripartite, right? Three in one, eternally existing in triune relationship. Every letter has a picture that has meaning, it has a numerical value, and it has a phonetic 
pronunciation. So what's, you know, for instance, uh, anybody know anybody named Evan? Any Evans? Yeah, okay, there you go. We got someone with a friend named Evan. Evan, or Eben, means stone. And stone is comprised of two words, Av and Ben. Av is father, Ben is son, Alven. Stone is literally the union of father and son, right? I will place a, a costly cornerstone, right? I will lay it in Zion. Who's the stone? Jesus says, I am one with the Father, and the Father is one with me. Prayer. Prayer in Hebrew is palal, which is pay, lamed, lamed. Pay is a mouth. It means to speak. And lamed is a shepherd's staff. And anytime something is reiterated in the Bible, God is saying, pay attention to this. He gives it more weight, more importance. Lamed, lamed doesn't mean just speak to authority. It means speak to the ultimate authority. And who's the ultimate authority? the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the living God. So we're going to use this, and we're going to go on now to the next slide. All right. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim va'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the very first letter highlighted is bait. Bait means house. It means to dwell with means to be inside of. The very first time it's mentioned is when uh, the ark, uh, and you shall cover it inside bait and out with pitch. We see that oftentimes bait is referring to a household, a family, a group of people. So from the very beginning, now the rabbis, this is taken from a, a book called Why the Torah Begins with the Letter Bait. There are hundreds of pages of rabbinical explanation of why did God not start the Torah with Aleph? It's like starting with letter B instead of A. Why did God start with the second letter? Well, I believe that what we see here is from the very beginning, God desired to build a house. God doesn't need us. God is an eternal relationship with himself. That's why he's love, because love can only exist in relationship. No other God can, can be love, only the triune God can be love. And from the very beginning, we see house, dwell. That is on God's heart, the tip of his tongue. Next slide. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In my father's house are many dwelling places, that where I am, there you may also be. For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell among them. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with Dwell. We see this at the very end in the New Testament. All this language about God dwelling. God used to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. And then sin severed that. And God has made a way via the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth, of the world, to bring us into relationship with Him again, to dwell with us again. And we see this at the very end, and the new heavens and the new earth are ushered in that God again will come down and dwell with mankind. The beginning and the end. The end is already declared in the very first letter of the, of the, the Torah. Next slide. This is the importance of marriage. The Bible begins with and ends with a marriage. Uh, marriage is not just a piece of paper, as many people um, reduce it to. Um, is something very sacred and, and very revealing of, of the nature of God's heart. For this reason, man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become echad, one flesh. And we see at the very end of Scripture, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. So it's all about a marriage. This is how God creates his family. And his family includes Natural, we would say biological, and also those who are adopted and grafted in. We, the Goyim, the Gentiles, we are brought into God's family. Every tribe, tongue, and nation will be and is in God's family. Next slide. And how long are we going to dwell in the bait, in the house, the family of God? Forever. This is an eternal, eternal union with our creator, the living God. So we see he wants to dwell with us. He wants to build a house, but how is he going to build it? Well, next slide. 
we see the first word, the word used in Isaiah, Rashit. Well, there's Rashit right there. Remember, house means in, so in, the beginning. Rashit means the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. But Rashit, every word has a, what's called a semantic domain, different meanings depending on the context. And this is something, next slide, that I think we can glean from this. Rashid also means first fruits, means in the first place, time, order, and rank, principal thing. So I believe you could render this, in the first fruits, Christ, God, created the heavens and the earth. Now, is there another witness? Because in order for something to be true biblically, there has to be two or three witnesses, all right? Here we have some witnesses in the New Testament, among others. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But each in his own order, who's the first fruits? Christ. Christ, the first fruits. And why is he the first fruits? We're going to get into that a little bit later. Then we have in Colossians 1, 16, Paul says, For in him were all things created. In who? In Christ, who is the first fruits. In Rashid. All things were created in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible Things invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things have been created through him and unto him. The entirety of creation, the entirety of the word of God is about Jesus and God building a house through him. Next slide. I'm the first, I'm the last. God himself says this to Isaiah multiple times. And we see Jesus in the revelation to John on the island of Patmos says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now, it's highlighted. That's Alpha and Omega right there. We'll get into how that is in Hebrew. But from the very beginning of Scripture, we see it right there in the middle of creation. The center point, the focal point of creation is this this little two-letter word. Now, in Hebrew, it has a grammatical function. It's a it, 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 it's a definitive direct object marker, so anything that has the, the definite article, it comes before to indicate that it's a definite um, thing, a definitive article. Uh, it's also used as a preposition, means with. But we're going to look at this not grammatically, not ignoring that, but we're going to look at it theologically. So next slide. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in the beginning with God, all things came into being through him. Again, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now, Aleph Tav, which is the equivalent, the Hebraic equivalent of Alpha and Omega, or A and Z, I'm the A and Z. Um, Remember, Hebrew has meanings to it. There's a pictograph, right? So when Jesus says that he is the Alpha and Omega, he's saying, I'm the Aleph Tav. Now, the Aleph Tav is representative of the entirety of the words. In Judaism, it's the word of God. Aleph Tav is the word of God. It's synonymous with the word of God because all the word of God is constructed from the 22 letters within it. But remember, it's a paleo pictograph. Uh, Next slide, please. The next slide, sorry, I'm behind the curve here. There we go. So... Here we have Aleph. Now, it would be right to left, but for us, for ease of reading, Aleph Tav. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the Aleph Tav. I wouldn't be dogmatic. I believe that uh, Jesus spoke to John in Hebrew, but again, that's my own opinion. But what we see here, Aleph Tav doesn't just mean first and last. If you take the meanings of the words and look at the, the ancient picture of Tav, it's a cross. This is long before the Roman Empire ever existed, long before there was such a thing as crucifixion. The cross and that tav represents a mark, a covenant, a sign, and the olive represents God and strength. What is he saying? He's saying, I am the God of the covenant. I am the strength of the covenant. And how is the covenant fulfilled? Through his blood shed on the cross. It's there in the very first sentence of Scripture. I have declared the end from the beginning. Next slide. And this is a very, uh, I say a Jewish way. So the Jewish, Judaism isn't monolithic. I mean, within Christianity, there's different denominations, same way in, in Judaism. But this is a very way, uh, Jewish way of looking at Scripture. 
The first letter in the Torah is Beit. The last letter is Lamed, which comes from the end of Israel, Yisrael. You put these letters together, and it spells heart. And what's fascinating is you get the picture that the shepherd is the one who leads into the house. Because there's only, if you look at the bait, there's only one door. There's only one way into that house. And who is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus. So, and we see this all, all over. And how does he do this? He renews us from the inside out. Because our hearts are deceitful, right? They're deceptive. They're desperately sick. That's where he says, circumcise your heart. Circumcise yourselves. I will give you a new heart. And we see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called the children, that we would be welcomed into his family. And one thing I want to point out is grace does mean unmerited favor, right? But more often than not, the word charis, where we get charisma, uh, is, is actually it means the divine influence upon the heart that's meant to be reflected in life. And grace and truth, the divine influence in the heart, comes through Jesus, John tells us. So next slide. And in here, we see et again. We see olive top again, but there's another letter before it. And that letter is vav, and vav is a nail. So from the very beginning, we can see what connects heaven and earth. Who's the intermediary? It's Jesus Christ. And we can see what connects them. Nail, cross. You could get from this, the strength of the covenant is secured by a nail. Now, how did that get there? In the very thousands of years before (laughs) that we ever got our copies of the Bible in English, from the very beginning, you see the gospel already described in the nucleus of the text, the microscopic level. Next slide. Now, I'll be honest with you, I have fallen asleep reading genealogies in the Bible. When you get to numbers, sometimes you're like, oh my goodness, I can't pronounce these names. I am tired because I unwisely often choose sometimes to read at night. And then before you know it, I'm out. Now I even get to the genealogy. And here we see one. This isn't even a long one, but we see from Adam all the way to Noah in Genesis 5. And then we see at the very end, remember this is the end from the beginning. Next slide, please. Um, we see a list of the tribes of Judah. Now, they're missing Dan. That's another sermon. But names in the Bible, as you all know, um, or you may not know, and it's okay if you don't, they are infused with meaning, and the meaning matters to the narrative. They're not just phonetically cool, all right? There's actually meaning. So next. So if you take the meaning of the, the names, you start to see something form. And what is that thing? Next slide. The genealogy in Genesis 5 reads, Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. Are you kidding me? In the text itself, we see the gospel spelled out that it's Jesus who will come down. God will come down. And he will teach. What's he going to teach? He's going to teach what God has told him to teach. And through his death, he shall bring us rest. And at the very end in Revelation 7, we can get this through the names. I will praise the Lord, for he has looked on me and granted me good fortune. Happy am I because my wrestling God is making me to forget. Don't you ever wish you could just not have to wrestle through life sometimes? God is with us and provides, but someday, loved ones, we won't have to wrestle. God will add, wait, he has purchased me a dwelling. He's, how did he purchase us? With the blood of Christ. And it comes back to what? Dwelling. So God, from the very beginning, I want to build a house. I want to have a family. And here we see it in the very text itself, embedded in the words. And God will add to me the son of the right hand. Who's, at, who's the son of the right hand? Who sits at the right hand of God the Father? Jesus. If you, all these questions, if you, if you don't know, the answer probably is Jesus. Because why? Next slide. It's all about the builder. In the beginning, laid you, Lord Jesus, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Again, he is the one who made everything. He says, destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days, 
uh, I will build another made without hands. And people would ask, is this not the, the carpenter? The word there is tecton. Now, it is a carpenter, but it's more broadly speaking of a builder, somebody who constructs and builds. So Jesus certainly built with other materials, maybe such as stone, other than wood. But he was a builder. So he is the builder of the house. And this, next slide, this is how he's going to do it. This is the blueprint. Every, this building didn't just get here. Somebody had to draw a design for this, a plan for this. And this is exactly what we see with God the Father. He says, this is how my son is going to build my house. We read right to left. Again, in our text, there's 10 words. In the Hebrew text, there's seven words. Seven matters. God is not a God of an author of confusion. He's an author, he's a, he's a God of pattern and cycles. And this is from the very beginning, the number seven becomes apparent. And in Genesis 1:14, God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, Moed, and for days and years. Now Moed means appointments. And if you take the letters. The, the, the meaning of the letters, what we get is life is secured to in seeing and knowing the way. So the sun, the moon, the stars were, were to tell his people, hey, pay attention. I want to intervene with, with you. I want to intersect with your lives at these various appointments, just like you would set up appointments in your own life. God says, these are appointments where I'm going to meet with you and I'm going to commune with you and fellowship with you and teach you things about me. And in the very nucleus of the word, life is secured to in seeing and knowing the way. They're all about Jesus. Next slide. And we see this in the heart of the Torah. This is what the Jewish people call Leviticus. They actually call it Vayikra, which means anti-called. So there's different, different names for the, the text, for the books. But the heart of the Torah, we see all these appointed times given to us. Um, and you can see that they are rehearsal. Remember when Moses was making the tabernacle, it was after the pattern of what existed in the heavenlies. All right, So these are rehearsals of what actually is happening. Uh, one could say they are shadows, because a shadow is produced by an object. So if you have, and it's always connected with that object. That is, if you see some, a shadow of somebody playing tennis, there's somebody literally playing tennis. It's not, there's not going to be a disconnect. There's not going to be somebody bowling and you see a shadow of somebody playing tennis. So the shadow is directly connected with the object that is, is, is making it. So next slide. Now this is just for consideration. In Colossians 2, 16, 17, uh, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now, uh, the NASB 95 little translation inserts mere, things are a mere shadow. Boy, I don't like that. Again, this is, um, this is my, my, more of my opinion coming out, but I want this to be food for thought, and I want you to chew on this. Anytime you see an italicized word, many of you know this, but you see an italicized word in Scripture, that means it was inserted. It was inserted by the translators. And why was it inserted? For a good reason, to help us understand it better in our language. But these words are not there. So if you read that again, take out days and take out is, now we get this. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come but the body of Christ. Now, I'm in the military. We operate very differently. All right, We used to. We don't we won't have it anymore. Have a rule where you couldn't walk around with your hands in your pocket. You know, if you were standing like this, you know, as a young airman, some crusty tech sergeant or master sergeant would come by and say, get your hands out of your pocket. Because that's a rule, that's a custom that we had. All right? But I wouldn't go to, I wouldn't go to a civilian and say, get your hands out of your pocket. Because they don't, they don't abide by our rules. It's a, I mean, Paul tells the Corinthians, why are you letting outsiders judge you? Don't you, you guys should be judging each other. He says, don't you know? You're, ju- you're going to judge angels. So there's things, and what I believe, and again, this is my opinion, I would dig into this, because the whole context of this passage, Paul is saying, stay away from vain teachings of Gentiles. Stay away from the ascetics who do all these things, and they worship angels and all this stuff, but don't let anybody judge you in these things, because 
they are the appointments of God, and I'm teaching you. And notice, they are shadows, present tense, not were. They are, and we're going to see this as we get ready to wrap this up. Next slide. The road to uh, Emmaus, we see all things Jesus says are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms must be fulfilled. That's what the Jewish people call what we call the Old Testament. They call it Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketavim, the law, the prophets, the Psalms. He's saying everything, it's about me. So they are shadows that point to him. Next slide. So this is his blueprint. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. Now, you might be saying, what in the wide world of sports is this? Well, I'm not going to go into all the detail. Pastor Matt has said, listen, if you want to come in, uh, and there's, if there's interest in it, I can do maybe a Sunday night class after the, you know, the Chosen uh, series is over to get more into depth on these. But I'll just show you how Jesus fulfilled these. On Passover, Jesus was at the very exact time, in the very exact typified way, he was crucified. Unleavened bread, all right? This is where we see um, Jesus before the crucifixion. He's make, he makes a whip, and he cleans out all the, the greedy money changers from the temple, which is what? His father's house, all right? All through uh, Jewish communities, and they still do today, they have a, they have a thing called Berakat Chametz, the search for leaven. They clean all the leaven out of their houses. So this is Jesus cleaning the leaven out of his father's house. He says, get out of here. This is the house of prayer, all right? And he's buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he's buried what? In an unused tomb from Joseph of Arimathea. So there's no corruption, no decay. He is sinless. And then he resurrects on the, the Feast of first fruits. We've come to note it as Easter. I'm, and just so you know, I'm not like a, one who's like against Easter and Christmas. Praise God, wonderful traditions. They teach us a lot. But these are from God himself, and this is exactly in the, in the Torah, when the Feast of First Fruits was to happen was the day after Sabbath, the first day of the week. And when did Jesus rise? The first day of the week. And you may have wondered, why didn't Jesus let Mary touch him? But yet Thomas touches him, you know, eight days later. Now, some texts say, you know, that she did, and he said, get away. There's different uh, versions. But let's say Jesus said, don't touch me. Well, why would he say that? Because he is everything. He's the offering, and he is the priest who offers it to God. And just as he was doing that, the high priest was waving the first sheaf of barley in front of the Lord in the temple. And if he had been defiled by a dead body, for instance, he wouldn't be able to offer the sacrifice. He wouldn't be offered the, the offering, I mean, of barley, the harvest. And if he couldn't do that, there would be no guarantee of the harvest to come, the wheat harvest, the fruit harvest. So Jesus said, I have to go to the Father and present myself to the Father first, and then I'll come back. Because he's doing what is happening in real time with the high priest. He, as the high priest, is doing in the heavenlies. And then Feast of Weeks, we know this is Pentecost. Pentecost, it wasn't the first Pentecost in Acts. 1,500 years before Pentecost happened at Sinai. And what's interesting is the text says they saw the thunderings. And Jewish tradition says there were tongues of fire that went throughout the camp. Very fascinating. And 3,000 people died at the hand of the Levites at the giving of the Torah at Sinai. What does the biblical text tell us? 3,000 were added when the Spirit was given. And there's a whole other sermon I'd like to speak about that. But this is when it's, it's, it's about first things. So Jesus, had, and these are at the exact times. I can't stress this enough. Genesis 1.14, Jesus, God says, these are appointments for you. I'm going to intersect with you at these times. These are called the spring feasts because they happen between March and June. Jesus fulfilled all of them literally at the exact times in the exact typified way. But there's three more remaining. Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus is what? He's coming back. So there's a second coming. And these three are the ones that speak of his return, not as the lamb, but the lion of Judah. When Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour, that's an idiomatic phrase, just like I would say it's raining cats and dogs. 
It's not literally raining cats and dogs, but we know what that means. It's a torrential downpour, all right? An idiomatic colloquialism for Feast of Trumpets is, it's the day no one knows the day or the hour. It's the only appointment that starts on a new moon. So there was a two-day two period where they had to have witnesses ready to see the moon to start the feast. And when he says, I'll come like a thief in the night, it's another idiom. The captain of the temple guards was known idiomatically as the thief in the night. And why? Because God had commanded his people, the Levites, to make sure the, the flames never went out on the altar, that they never went out on the menorah, on the golden lampstand. And if the temple, the captain of the temple guards would come by and see a priest sleeping, they would take a hot coal and they would place it on the garment of the sleeping priest. That's why Jesus says all the time, stay what? Stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. And he would take that, that coal and place it on the garment, the very flammable garden, garment of the priest, and the priest would wake up with his clothes on fire and have to run out of the temple naked. So these things, there's a context to it. Now, we can still get the point that Jesus is coming back, but there's a depth that God wants us to have to deepen our trust and relationship with him. It's also known as the wedding of Messiah. This is exactly how a Jewish wedding works. Remember, Jesus is going to come at one point halfway, and then the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive in Christ will be taken up. Harpazo, rapture. That's a, that's, that is Jewish wedding language, because what happens even today? The betrothal happens, the, the bridegroom goes back to their father. This happens in Orthodox families in, in Israel today. The bridegroom goes back to their father's house. Up to a year, they will build an addition on the father's house in which they will consummate their, their marriage. And only the father tells the son when he can go get his bride. And it usually happens at night. And they go back, they go to the bride's house, and they, they don't go all the way to the house. They usually go to the gate of the city, and they blow shofars. I'll bring those in someday and blow it. But uh, they blow shofars, and the bride has to be ready. And when she hears that sound, she's to get up, already ready to go, and go back with the bridegroom to the father's house to consummate the wedding. After which, they come out, and there's the wedding feast, all right? And this is what we see in Feast of Tabernacles is the wedding feast, the final harvest, the consummation of everything, and the new heavens and the new earth are ushered in. So um, that's a, a brief overview there. And let's go next slide. Go ahead and skip the next slide, and we'll wrap this up here. So God leads me in, us in cycles. Pastor Matt gave a wonderful sermon series on Psalm 23, probably the most well-known. Oh, next slide. Oh, no, that's it. I'm sorry. Go back, please. Sorry. Um, probably the best-known psalm out there. But as we dig into the Word, this, path, this, this, this verse has always stuck out to me. When I found it, it's like once you see something, you can't unsee it. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's all for him. The word there for paths is magal, which means a trench. And it stems from the root word. Every Hebrew word has a three, usually a three-letter root word. It stems from, it's connected to, the meanings are intertwined, from agol, which means to revolve, circular. Now, there's nothing, there's a linear progression in time and space, the way God has designed time and space, but God does, he's a God of patterns and cycles. It's like the more you read the Bible, the more you read a passage, God says, this time I'm going to show you this. You could have read it a hundred times and, and something new jumps out to you because he leads you. And the more you do that, the implication is, the more you follow God, the more you create a trench, the more that your footing is secured and it keeps you from going to the left and to the right. It's exactly how God works. Next slide. And this is his cycle, his main cycle. You can see the Gregorian calendar and you can, that we use, and you can see the Hebrew calendar. Every now and then they'll put a 13th month in. Uh, it's like a 19-year cycle, really complex, but nonetheless, it keeps the feasts in their appointed times. In Islam, they have Ramadan. Ramadan uh, changes every year because they base their calendar on the moon. We base our calendar, the Julian and Gregorian, on the sun. God bases his calendar on both, lunar, solar. That's how God does it. Next slide. And this is just, again, um, another little... And if you want these slides, 
I'll be happy to, to give them to you, and you can do your own research and dig in more. Um, again, of the spring feast, the first coming. And in Judaism, there's this concept of Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, the suffering servant and the, the conquering king. They look at two separate messiahs, neither of which are God, but we know it's one messiah who comes twice. Um, next slide. All right, so what, what does this all mean? It's a lot of information. Um, and I, I, again, encourage you to, to ask for the slides, ask me questions, dig into this, because um, it's not a vain exercise. It's not just an academic exercise. It really does. Um, it has led me to a deeper relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus. So we see, remember, the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Sometimes we know things we just we need to remember. <laughs> we need to have somebody in our life to say, hey, I see this, I see this. Don't you remember? And it brings us back to center. So as we leave here today, I would ask you, and I would pray, the Lord that, next slide please, you would first and foremost remember there's no one like our God. He is an absolute control. There is no rival. There is no close second. He fears no one, all right? And he's a loving father and he is in control and he can be trusted. Remember, in Christ, you are part of God's house, his family. And the Holy Spirit dwells within you. He's wanted it from the very beginning. And we are living that out in time and space right here in Ohio, 2024. The very beginning, we are living that out. We have a part in God's house, his family. And remember what Jesus, the builder, capital B, the only one, what he's done and what he's doing for you restoring your life and building you up, building us, a mishpacha, a family, up. And remember lastly that God has a blueprint to build his house. He has a plan and he has a purpose, and this includes a plan for you. And what's amazing is throughout any given day, you know, I can take all these things that I may, I may have anxiety about, I may have frustration about, God wants to hear it. He's this great, awesome, amazing God who has who lives outside of time and space and from the very beginning has done these miraculous things. And he says, hey, hey, Mike, come here. What's on your heart? That's the God we serve. And last slide, he wants to hear from us. And he has said, it is the words of Peter that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, when? Since the world began. So I'm going to end today, for all you Star Trek fans, what, what is this? Live long and prosper. You know, Leonard Nimoy was Jewish, right? So this is a priestly, the priestly blessing is always given with this. And this is the Hebrew letter Shin. And the rabbis say this stands for Shaddai. Shaddai, Almighty, El Shaddai. It's an acronym, Shaddai. It's three letters, Shin, Dalet, Yod. That means Shamar, Daltot, Yisrael, guardian of the gates of Israel. And when the priest will give his blessing, they still do this today, the priest will stand and make one giant shin, speaking that I am your guardian. Not the priest, the God who has given that priestly blessing over his people. And in fact, he says over his children, his family. All right, so we're going to end today with a priestly blessing and then we're going to go 
in shalom. Shalom means peace, but it also means wholeness because God is making us whole. He's making us complete. All those areas where we feel deficient, all those things we struggle with, God is making us complete in Christ. Please stand with me. Yivarekaka Adonai va'ishmareka Yair Adonai panav alecha v'ikuneka Yisa Adonai panav alecha v'yasemleka May the Lord bless you and guard you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, which the world cannot take away. We pray this. We thank you for this blessing in the name of the Prince of Peace, in the name of all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.